As promised in the previous lecture, we're now going to look at Mendel's second half, the second half of Mendel's paper. And in that paper, he was asking questions like this. This is the first one that he addressed. What happens if I take a variety? Now remember, this variety is true breeding. How does he know it's true breeding? Remember, he went through a series of, of generations where he self-fertilized these plants to make sure they were true breeding. So he has true breeding spherical, or round if you wish, and yellow. And he crosses those with wrinkled and green. Okay, now let's, before we continue on and predict what we'd expect to see in the next generation, let's think how does this differ from what he was talking about before. If you look at it, before he was only looking at round versus wrinkled, or he was looking at yellow versus green. He wasn't looking at both at the same time. Here he's looking at both at the same time because he's wondering, is the genetical situation or whatever is causing the genetics, remember I'm saying it in this way because that's kind of how he was thinking, are these related between seed shape and seed color? Are there, is there somehow they're connected? And it's sort of like us asking this, do people with blonde hair tend to have blue eyes or black hair tend to have brown eyes? Now, we tend to think we know the answer to the second question. Turns out we, most of us actually don't. But the point is, that's the kind of question he's asking. How are these traits related to each other? Okay, so, now, let's get to the prediction. What would you expect to see in the F1 from this situation? Well, we saw before when he crossed round versus wrinkled, the F1 was round. All of them were round. Which meant that if this were generative fluid, then the round individual would have been the only individual to give fluid to the offspring. And the same thing with yellow. If we take yellow and, and cross it with green, the offspring are all yellow, and we would then expect that the offspring then are, are, are going to be some sort of mixture of the two if it's generative fluid. But what we saw in the previous lecture was that Mendel showed that wasn't true, or Mendel made the argument that that wasn't true and came up with the evidence for it. What Mendel argued was that these are particles, these are particulate sort of things, whatever they happen to be, he didn't know what they were. But somehow they mix in this F1, but then they can unmix in the F2, and that's not possible with fluid. So that then would make us predict, okay, well, if this is true and the rest of his concepts are true, then we would have two particles determining each trait. So two particles are determining the spherical nature of this individual and the yellow color that it has. And two particles would be determining the wrinkled and another two particles would be determining its green. So what we're talking about here is four particles, not just two like we saw in the previous lecture. So that's the key difference. He's looking at two of these at a time. And therefore, he's got to have two particles that determine seed shape and two particles that determine seed color if his hypothesis is correct. Okay, now what would we then predict? Well, are these connected? Would these be connected somehow? And if they are, the spherical would somehow have to be connected to yellow and the wrinkled would have to somehow be connected to green. Either way, whether they're connected or not connected, you would predict in the F1 that you would get spherical yellow because when we did this cross before, Spherical dominated green and yellow dominated, or sorry, spherical dominated wrinkled and yellow dominated green. So he does this, and in 7,000 or so plants, he gets exactly that. He gets spherical yellow, and that's what he got. They were just as spherical as the original parent and just as yellow as the original parent. Okay, so his next step was to do this. Let's cross these F1s and let's see what happens. Okay, we're going to cross the F1s. Let's think about what he saw in his previous experiments. What did he see? Well, remember in the F2 when he did, when he did this, he saw a 3 to 1 ratio. Okay, well, would you predict a 3 to 1 ratio here? I mean, it's the same kind of experiment. It should be a 3 to 1 ratio. Well, if he does the experiment, and this is exactly what he did, here's exactly what he got. And I'm not making these numbers up. These numbers are not coming out of thin air. These are the numbers he himself reported. 315 were round yellow. 108 were round green, 101 were wrinkled yellow, and 32 were wrinkled green. Okay, not 3 to 1, obviously. But again, when you think about it, it makes sense. Not really 3 to 1 because, you know, we're talking about two traits now at a time, not just one. So we do expect something different. And if you said that before, good for you. That's exactly what we predict. But wait a minute. Look at this more carefully. Look at this right here. This number, 315, to this number, 108. That's kind of close to 3 to 1, isn't it? This number here, 315 to 101. Also kind of close to 3 to 1. And this number, 108 to 32, also close to 3 to 1. 101 to 32, 
also close to three to one. Now remember, Mendel was a mathematician as well as a biologist. He looked at those numbers and he saw something very important. He saw that immediately, but he saw that. He said, this tells me something. This tells me that the seed shape and the seed color are independent, meaning no matter what the seed shape is, has no effect on the color of the seed. How does he know that from just these numbers? Well, look at this. This is kind of a three to one ratio, but it's a bunch of three to one ratios interacting. And if you think about it too, three to one, and this is three to one, that makes this three to three to one, that's nine to one. What is that? Well, Mendel saw what it was. Mendel understood it. He saw that not as a three to, three to one ratio. He understood that that was a three to one squared ratio. And the only way it's possible that you're going to get a three to one squared ratio is if these traits are independent. And I'm going to demonstrate that here for you in just a moment. But the point is that data, that information, just counting numbers up, indicated to him that these things are independent, that the traits are independent of each other. Now, as before, Mendel was careful. He didn't just fly off the handle and say, hey, look, I've made this one discovery off one study, and I'm just going to spew out this result that must be true. Just like we saw before, he dug around and found a number, seven, total seven traits that followed that original pattern. And here we're only looking at combination of two of these traits, the seed shape and the seed color. Now he claims in his paper to have done every possible combination of those, of pairs of those seven traits. It's a lot, that's a lot of work. And he didn't report all of the data. So it's unclear exactly what he did or, or didn't do, but it doesn't matter. We've repeated those experiments completely and discovered that, in fact, his statement is, in fact, correct. All of those seven traits are independent of each other, meaning choose any two of them and do this experiment. When you do this kind of experiment with any two of those traits, of those seven, you're going to get a 3 to 1 squared ratio in the F2. All right, so that then tells us something. That tells us that no matter what you do when you have these three to one squared ratios of those seven traits, no matter what, those traits are independent of each other. So that means things like the seed color doesn't have any effect on the flower color and vice versa. The Whether or not the, the pod is green or yellow is independent of whether the seed is green or yellow. Those kinds of things. So all of those combinations that are independent, they all came from a three to one squared because the only way you're going to get a three to one squared is if they're independent. Why is that? Why, why, why? We're going to see that in a minute. I, I'll demonstrate that if you don't see it for, at, at the moment. But before we do that, we have to understand exactly what's going on here. So we're going to demonstrate what's going on. Mendel had to do that too in his paper. But before we continue, let's just think about this for a moment. Now, Mendel's original statement, beyond being particulate, was that these traits are determined by two genes, by two copies of the same gene. They can be different alleles, but they're still two copies of the same gene. One of those copies comes from one parent, the other copy comes from another parent. Okay, so those two things then are critical here. We can use that to figure out, for example, what is this, the genotype of the round yellow parent. What I'm asking for, for specifically is this. What is the genotype of this round yellow individual? Well, okay, round, if you remember, round could be determined by either the homozygote or the heterozygote because round was dominant. So therefore, round could be big R, big R, or it could be big R, little r. And the same thing with yellow could be big Y, big Y, or big Y, little y. But the issue is this. Remember, before he started his experiment, he made sure that all of his, off or all of his original plants were true breeding, which means he planted them and went through generations and tested to make sure that they were all true breeding. Therefore, he knows that these must be homozygous. Because if they were, if any of them were heterozygous, he would have gotten some that were not true breeding and he would have thrown them out. So when he starts, he knows then that the round yellow parent has to be big R, big R, big Y, big Y. Okay, what about the wrinkled green parent? Well, those he also tested to make sure they were true breeding, but if his hypothesis is correct, it wouldn't matter. Anything that is wrinkled is true breeding and anything that's green is true breeding when it breeds with itself. So, Therefore, these would have to be little r, little r, r, little y, little y. Okay, now think about this for a moment. Why do I have four letters here? Well, remember, two of these traits each have two alleles, 
two different genes or two genes contributing to them. So therefore, there has to be four. This individual has two R's because it has a, a, a seed color, and seed color is determined by two of these particles, according to Mendel. It also has a seed color, and therefore, that color has to be uh, determined by two of these particles as well. So seed shape has two, seed color has two, and therefore, this has to have four. Same thing with this one. Okay, what about the F1? Let's go back to this. In the F1, we're looking at a cross between this round yellow parent and the wrinkled green parent. In other words, we're looking at a cross between this individual and this individual. Following that same rule, each individual is only going to give one particle for each trait. So this individual, for seed shape, only gives a big R and can only give a big Y. Therefore, a big R and a big Y to its offspring are being contributed by it. But the other parent must be little r, little y. The other parent must be contributing a gamete that is little r, little y. Because again, it only gives one r, one y. So therefore, the offspring must have a big r and a little r from, one, from those two parents, and a big y and a little y from those two parents. So it must be big r, little r, big y, little y, which makes it a dihybrid. In this situation, when we call something a hybrid, what we mean is that it's heterozygous. So this is heterozygous in two traits, therefore dihybrid. You can also call it double heterozygous. I don't really care, but the, the standard nomenclature is dihybrid. Okay, now let's look and think about what would happen when this self-fertilizes. It is going to follow the same rule if Mendel's hypothesis is correct. It's going to give one of these R's to its offspring and one of these Y's to its offspring. Because again, the offspring are, are the seeds are going to have a shape and they're going to have a color. So therefore, each parent is going to have to give one gene for shape and one gene for color so they can combine in the offspring. Okay, so what kinds of gametes can this individual make when it gives one R and one Y? That's the rule. Well, if you look at this, you're actually looking at a mathematical thing you've seen before. In fact, we just saw it a second ago. Foil. First, outers, inners, lasts. This is expanding a binomial. It's the same exact mathematical process. The point I want to make. When we're talking about this kind of stuff, you notice mathematics keeps coming in. That's because nature speaks mathematics. Nature's natural language is mathematics. So all the stuff that you're learning in your math class is absolutely applicable here. So here we go. We've got this. Why do I say it's FOIL? Well, think about this. One R, one Y. How many different ways can I choose one R and one Y when I have two of each? Well, I could take the firsts, in which case I get a big R, big Y. I could take the outers, in which case I get a big R, little y. I could take the inners, in which case I get a little r and a, little, and a big y. Or I could take the lasts and get a big R, or I'm sorry, a little r and a little y. So those are the kind of gametes that can be made by this individual following the simple rule that it can only give one R and one Y to its offspring. It can give any of these four to its offspring. And it gives equal numbers of each. That's part of the independence idea, is that R and Y are put together independently of each other. Meaning this, if I put a big R into the gamete, that doesn't change the probability that I put a big or a little Y into the gamete, and vice versa. So that's the key. When I have these things being independent, the R's and Y's being independent, then I get equal numbers of all four of these possibilities. Okay, so now let's look at the consequences of this. All right, let's just double check to make sure that everything that we've said so far leads to the result that Mendel saw. And of course, Mendel had to do that in his paper too. That's the demonstration part of this. Okay, so what he's saying is this. Look, when I started, I knew because of all that breeding experiment that I did before to make sure everything was true breeding was that the round yellow individual had to be big R, big R, big Y, big Y. And the wrinkled green individual had to be little r, little r, little y, little y. Now, if what we're saying is true and that each individual is going to give one of uh, these particles for each trait, then this has to give a big R and a big Y to the offspring there. And this has to give a little R and a little Y to the offspring here. They combine if this is the sperm fertilizing that egg or this is the egg, sperm fertilizing this egg. Either way, it doesn't matter. We combine the R's together and we get a big R, a little R, big Y, little Y. Now, just by convention, we put the R's together and the Y's together, even though they're coming from different parents. It's just to make things a little bit easier to see. But now, since this has to be big R, little r, big Y, little y, the phenotype must be round because it's got a big R and yellow because it's got a big Y. Okay, so far so good. That's exactly what he saw. 
But now he says, okay, independently, the R's and the Y's are going to be put into the gametes, one for each gamete per trait. So that means then when we make offspring, when we're going to put gametes together that are just the gametes that we saw before. Big R, big Y, big R, little Y, little R, big Y, little R, little Y. Okay, so those are going to be coming from this F1. Now remember in that experiment, he's fertilizing the F1 with itself. So that means then the, if this is the female part of the plant and it's making these eggs, the male part of the plant is going to be making sperm through exactly the same process. And that process is going to take one R, one Y, put it into the offspring, and therefore it's going to end up with the exact same types of, of genotypes. Okay, so now we have these sperm fertilizing these eggs. And this is the exact same thing that we did before. This is a Punnett square that's indicating how the sperm and the egg combine. So for example, this square right here is this sperm fertilizing this egg. Both the sperm and the egg are carrying all large number uh, letters and therefore we have to be big R, big R, big Y, big Y. And again, the uh, phenotype is going to be round because of the big R's and yellow because of the big Y's. Okay, now, if we look at this, then every single one of these is simply a combination of these two things. Say, let's just take randomly this one. Right there, well, that is this sperm fertilizing this egg. The sperm and the egg are both carrying a little r, therefore it's a little r, little r, and they're also both carrying a big Y, therefore it's big Y, big Y. Because it's little r, little r, this is going to be wrinkled. Because it's big Y, big Y, this is going to be yellow, so it's wrinkled yellow. Okay, now this pattern arises if and only if the R and the Y are put in independently. If they're not put in independently, you're going to get something different because the frequencies of each of these is going to be different than one quarter each. But when we get this one quarter each, these are the things we get. And what do we get? Well, let's count up all the round uh, yellows. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right? Let's count up all of the round greens. One, two, three. Let's count up all the wrinkled yellows. One, two, three. And let's count up then all of the Yodas, the wrinkled green. Only this one. All right? And so therefore we have nine round yellow to three green round to three wrinkled yellow to one wrinkled green. And that is the expanded 3 to 1 ratio. And it arises only because we get equal numbers of each of these things, which arises only because the R's and the Y's are independent. So he claims to have done this for all the different traits, all pairs of those seven traits that he had, and he claims he got a 3 to 1 each time. Whether or not he did that, we don't know. Doesn't matter. We demonstrated later that he was exactly correct. That statement is exactly correct. Therefore, all of these traits are independent of each other.